Hello, and welcome to Sundays at Coastal. This week, Pastor Andy Rock continues in the book of Galatians with a sermon titled, Living in God's Freedom. In this uplifting message from Galatians, we're reminded of the freedom found in living with love, forgiveness, and trust in Jesus. We're called to care for our communities without division, knowing our worth isn't tied to perfect obedience, but to God's unwavering love. The story of Abraham and Sarah shows us that even when we falter, God's promises hold true. Instead of proving ourselves, we stand firm in the freedom Jesus gives, allowing His love to transform us and bring hope to others. Let's embrace this freedom together, trusting that our smallest acts of love can bring a lasting impact. Hi guys. Good morning. Welcome everyone. We're so glad you're here. Um, If you are new or visiting, welcome. It's no small thing to show up to a church for the first time or second or even third time and not know anybody. Mark your calendars for that 15th of September if you're new within the last couple of months because I want to have you over. I want to have barbecue for you. We'll get to know each other and connect. It'll be great. So, uh, so glad that you can, uh, hope you can join us. So I have a question for you. Can I have permission to speak to you about your, to your heart of hearts today. Would that be okay? Okay. So can I give a quick recap in case you forgot what I said the last two weeks? Because I can barely remember. Okay. Not that it, uh, here it is. In the last two weeks in the book of Galatians, Paul has spoken to the churches in that region about our inheritance. And our inheritance is God himself. Okay. When you love someone and sacrifice for them and forgive them when their behavior is either good or bad, you will feel and sense and know the goodness of God because you're committed to their restoration in a way that they've never experienced. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. Your inheritance is God himself, and this is how God treats you. That he loves you and cares for you and adores you, whether you're good or bad, because he's committed to your restoration. And when you do that for someone else, you will know and have a feeling and a sense of God's goodness like never before. Will it be easy? No. Will it be good? Yes. When your world is crumbling and you stand in faith, faith, honest about how you're doing, vulnerable, but determined to hold on to your heart and Jesus and not go backwards into resentment or into isolation or shutting your heart off. Not only will you be an inspiration to those around you, but you'll have steel in your bones like never before because you're choosing to trust your risen savior. Amen? Amen. When the world wants to draw tribal lines because of wars or elections or morals, we will be the people who love everyone that we meet and people will start to see that the kingdom of God is a place where there's always hope beyond our brokenness. And most importantly, since your inheritance is God himself with you, in you, as you love and care and forgive for those within your reach and you're doing it with Jesus, close to him, with his wisdom and his love and his security and his hope flowing through your bones, it's really the only way to live. Do you want to choose this way of living? So this is what we say every week. Are you ready? Today, I choose to be changed by Jesus. I choose to seek Jesus first, and I choose to join Jesus is in resurrection work. Amen? Amen? Of course, there's always an alternative way to live. There really is, and this is what we talked about last week, and I, we t- I talked about tribalism last week, and I know that for a lot of people that was a new concept. I want to uh, reiterate it because it's such an important thing to know. It really, it is one of the principal ways that I've been able to orient myself to what is happening in our country in the last 50 years, and you need to know this in order f- to figure out what's happening. Um, Citizenship is the idea that we take responsibility for our family and our community and our city and our state and our country, no matter if I agree or disagree with the people in it. Does that make sense? So that's citizenship. I'm here to love, be responsible, pay my taxes, serve, do all the things, be a good pickup, litter, whatever, right? 
build a community here at this church because I want to bless everybody within the five cities. And as churches do that all throughout the state and as communities do that all throughout the state, even with the people that we don't agree with, all of a sudden, a whole, our whole state and our whole country and our whole nation and the whole world gets transformed. That's the story of the church. Tribalism is different. It's similar in that I am here in a tribe to take care of the people that I'm within arm's reach and that I love and, and, and I care about. But tribalism is different in that I only am doing that for those I agree with. Does that make sense? And then tribes then create purity laws that exclude people who either disagree or transgress those laws. And so we talked about silly examples of that last week, like if you don't drive an electric vehicle or you don't recycle or if you don't like NASCAR or if you don't, right? And those are like, those are memes, those are tropes of, of conservative or liberal, right? But, but we all know what those purity laws are within our group of friends or in our country right now, right? And tribes say this, you're unclean, you're out if we disagree. You're unclean if you do something wrong, and what you have to do if you, if you disagree or do something wrong is that you have to somehow purify yourself in order to get back in. Does that make sense? That's our country right now. And this way of looking at the world and tribalism actually seeps into our understanding of how it is that we connect with God. And so right now, and you can see this over the last 50 years in the history of, our, of the church, in the last 50 years, we've grown more and more tribal and therefore God is someone that will kick you out unless you are all the way pure and you have to do all these things in order to get back to God. Does that make sense? It's a lie from the pit of hell. That's not the story of scripture at all. The story of scripture is that God goes out into hell to get us. Not that we purify ourselves in order to get to him. Someone said amen. amen. This week, we're going to talk about what it looks like since those purity laws and that tribalism, those walls have all been dissolved by the blood of Jesus. All of us who are now dead are now alive unclean are now clean. Amen? Amen. Okay. Since we're all welcome home, those of us who've been the younger brothers and rebelled and those of us who've been the older brothers and stayed and rebelled in our own way, we're all, we're all welcome home. We're all part of the family now. Since all those lines have now dissolved, what does it look like for us to live in freedom? And that's what Paul is going to talk about today in one of the most spectacular verses in the book of Galatians. Um, and if you can get this on a press on, press on tattoo, do it because it's, it's worth it. But in order to get there, I, Paul's going to talk to us today about a story. And that story is quite long. And with your permission, I'm going to truncate it uh, so that we don't spend three hours in today's sermon. Is that okay? Yes. Amen. It's the most agreement we've had in church in a long time. That's great. Um, so, can I speak to your heart, heart of hearts today about living in freedom? Yes. And can I speak to your heart of hearts about how to hold on to your freedom when the enemy wants to take it away? Yes. That'd be okay? Yes. So, let's pray with me. Jesus, we need you and we trust you and we just, again, bind and silence everything opposed to Christ that wants to rob us of our freedom now in the name of Jesus. Do you guys agree? Yes. Father, may your kingdom come and your will be done. We love you, Lord. Amen. Okay, so we're in Galatians chapter four, and Paul says this. Again, he's talking to the church. The church has been so kind to him. Church after church after church after church in the region of Galatia has always welcomed Paul, and he always showed up battered and broken because the last city he left beat the tar out of him. And the church, made up of Jews and Gentiles, they didn't care about the purity laws. They just loved Paul back to life. And Paul says this, where then, do we have say, yeah, where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. This is one of the verses that we have in the New Testament. The other one is in the book of Colossians. He says at the end of Colossians, look with how 
I'm writing so big with my own handwriting. This is, these are, those are two verses that we have, plus in Corinthians where he says that there's a thorn in the flesh. He says, um, he says you know what? Uh, there's something wrong with my eyes. That's what Paul says. So we don't know what it was. Maybe he, he just got stoned one, one too many times, <laughs> right? And he literally did. I mean, when you throw rocks at someone's head, I think it might affect their vision, Right? Um, But he might have had macular degeneration or glaucoma. Because at the end of Colossians, um, he writes, again, I'm writing with my own hand. And what Paul is saying here, he's like, look, you guys have loved me so much, you literally would restore my eyesight by plucking out your own eyes. How come you can't love each other that way? What's going on? And then Paul adds... Don't get mad at me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? He's like, don't get mad at me for telling you the truth of all this. I'm still loving you even when I confront you. Say that to the person next to you. (laughs) I'm still loving you even when I confront you. Oh, don't be chickens. Come on, say it. (laughs) We... We need to be reminded that our love for each other is far more important than whether or not we agree about everything or have the same preferences. Amen? Amen. I'll never forget uh, living in New Jersey following uh, 9-11, and everyone in our town was banded together, which is a miracle for New Jersey. New Jersey is a place where people hate, right, for fun, okay? Right? Uh, In New Jersey, uh, the motto is, only the strong survive, okay? Uh, And after 9-11, everybody in New Jersey, everybody in the tri-state area of Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York, we were all banded together. It was, was, we were all in perfect unity, right? And then a year later, everyone hated each other again (laughs) about their baseball teams or how they drove or their political preferences. And our pa- the point is this, our passions and our preferences and our opinions are just fine until they create division. And thus Paul says, verse 17, those people who are zealous to win you over, but for no good, what they want to do is alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided that the purpose is good. And and to, be, and to be so always, not just when I'm with you. So here's the point that Paul's making, have opinions. Oh, let me pray. Jesus, help. Amen? (laughs) Amen. Have opinions. Be zealous. Look, I love Thai food, right? Debbie, who was holding her granddaughter, she hates Thai food, okay? I love extra salt on my French fries. Denise is our children's director. She wipes the salt off of her French fries, okay? The only condiments that you should ever put on a hot dog are mayonnaise and onions, All my friends like ketchup, okay? Kurt hates steak. I love steak, okay? Now, obviously, with all of these opinions, I'm correct, okay? Um, But I'm not going to create division about it. Does that make sense? Here's the point. If your friends want to convince you that they're right, And then the plan is then to separate you from those they disagree with. That's how you know they're wrong. Opinions are great. Division is hell. Opinions are about what we think. Division happens in the heart. I'm never going to quote Second Opinions chapter 2 as a way to cut you out of my life. Does that make sense? Division feels awful. It's, and when you divide someone out of your life within your own heart, it's actually awful for you as well. And when someone cuts you out of their life, it's even worse. I'm never going to separate you from my heart because we disagree about politics or about food preferences or about something else. Does that make sense? But with opinions, I have the pleasure of saying If I were to agree with you, we'd both be wrong. And then we can all laugh. Nine of you laughed. I'll make a note to kick that out of the second service right there. Did not work. Okay. So now 
what's Paul's point here? He's saying, look, we can disagree about stuff but have no division. And now what Paul's going to do is he's going to create a, he's going to give an example from Scripture for the Jewish Christians that are causing all the trouble because they want to have tribal purity laws. And we can understand this as a church today. You've been to churches where you're not allowed to be there unless you have the right attire or vote the right way or have your life perfectly together. Some sin is fine, other sin's not okay. Does that make sense? Those are tribal purity lines. And Paul's saying that's not from Jesus. And he's gonna give an example to all of the Jewish Christians from their own story that will help them take a calm down, take a woe. Does that make sense? This is where I'm gonna truncate the story here just a little bit, just for the sake of time. Galatians 4.21 says this. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not of what the law says? So step one on Paul's argument, if you want to create all these tribal lines about laws, then you better follow every single one of them. Okay? So here's the example. Verse 22. Will you read this with me? For it is written... One by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. Do you know this story? You might not. Can I tell it to you? This is in the book of Genesis. I promise you, you won't fall asleep. This is a lot of fun. Abraham was 75 years old when he left his uh, father's tent and married Sarah and moved out from his parents' house. 75. You think it took a while to launch your kids? Just have compassion on Abraham's death. Okay? The happy couple traveled to the land that we now call Israel. Do I have a picture of Abraham, Chris? Next slide after this? Maybe not. Should be it. There he is. There's Abraham. Okay? <laughs> So the happy couple traveled to the land that we now call Israel, following God's call. Now, there was a famine. It was bad. They don't trust God to provide. So they head down to Egypt. Now, there's this guy named Pharaoh, and he sees Sarah. And Sarah is absolutely drop-dead gorgeous, by the way, right? Abraham pulled a 10. He didn't deserve it, okay? <laughs> and he, Pharaoh says to Abraham, <clears throat> hey, can I by Sarah. And Abraham knows that he'll be killed if he says no. But rather than sacrifice himself for his wife, he says, well, actually, she's my sister. So go ahead. And he gets a lot of money for Pharaoh in selling Sarah to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, after one night with Sarah, him and his whole household get diseases everywhere on their bodies. And Pharaoh goes, I think we have a slide for that. This is the historical picture. That's what it looked like. Um, <clears throat> and Pharaoh profusely apologizes to Abraham and says, please take Sarah. This is just a curse is on my household. And here's even more money. So if Abraham and Sarah go into Egypt, basically almost starving, and they leave multimillionaires. Abraham didn't have to do anything. Sarah had a rough night. <laughs> I would not want to be Abraham on that road trip <laughs> at all. Pharaoh, remember, million, they're multimillionaires, not just in gold, but in, in cattle and in livestock and in servants. And one of those servants is a young woman named Hagar. Okay? Fast forward 11 years. All of the servants are having children. The family's growing, and Sarah still hasn't had kids. And instead of trusting God's promise that their descendants would be more than the stars in the sky, which is what God promised to Abraham, Sarah comes up with a terrible idea. Abraham, you'll sleep with Hagar, and I'll be there for every moment, including the, in the act, the pregnancy, and in the birth, and it'll be like the baby is my baby, right? Worst idea ever. Abraham should have said no. But Hagar's 25, and she's gorgeous as well. And Abraham says, okay. <laughs> Idiot, okay? Hagar gives birth to a son. They name him Ishmael. 
And Abraham adores his son and, and Hagar a little bit too much for Sarah's liking. Sarah gets insanely jealous and literally kicks Hagar and the child, Ishmael, out into the desert, hoping they will die. God saves them. That's a different story. So why tell this story? That's the story that Paul says, verse 22 for 31, that I'm skipping over. Why tell that story? For Jewish Christians insisting on following all the tribal rules of Judaism and declaring all those who, don't, who break the rules is unclean, Paul points out this mind-blowing tooth. He says this. Okay, kids, ready? Abraham and Sarah weren't perfect. They messed it all up. And God still made good on his promise because this whole thing isn't about our effort. It's about God's immense love for us. Amen? Listen, the point of school isn't to pass all the tests so that you can get a job where you pass tests. Okay? The point of school is to learn. It's to become a learner your entire life so that you can become an amazing human being. The point of laws isn't not to break all of the laws or to pass all of the tests and then condemn others who don't pass the test. The point of the law is to become the kind of person succeeding or failing who knows and rests and trusts in Jesus. That's the point. Does that make sense? One of the things that's going to transform your relationship with God is to understand that God isn't mad at you because you did something wrong. When you think of God that way, you think of God as someone who only cares about you following the rules. I want you to understand that your relationship with God is like this. It's like, I don't want to break my father's heart. Does that make sense? That's the difference. Do you remember the name that Abraham and Sarah finally give their kid? That's right. His name is Isaac. So Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah's 90. And with the failure of Hagar and Ishmael still lingering like a bad smell in the tent. And it's, it's Bakersfield, 114 degrees. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, and two angels show up and tell Sarah that she's pregnant. And at this time, both of them finally trust God and begin to laugh. And that's what Isaac's name means, is laughter. Now, I don't know if you know this about Hebrew or not, but each letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. And thus, each word, if you add up the numerical values of the letters, has its own numerical value. And thus, different words can have the same numerical value. And in Hebrew, those words are related and they help you understand. The numerical value of Isaac is 208 and the only other word in Hebrew with a numerical value of 208 is arava, which means to multiply or many. And what's the, what's the promise God makes to Abraham and Sarah? I'm gonna give you a family that will be so many, they'll be like stars in the sky. When God makes a promise to you, God is the one who fulfills the promise. Can we say that together? When God makes a promise to you, God is the one who fulfills that promise. You don't need to scratch and scramble. God promised me last week that this is going to happen here at this church. What will happen here at this church is better than what has already happened and what I could never imagined. And that's not going to happen with me stressing and freaking out all the time and trying to make it happen by myself. Amen. When God makes a promise, God is going to fulfill that promise. And God is inviting me to trust him. And thus Paul says to the church in Galatia next, verse 5, 1, will you read this with me? Come on, put some pepper on it. Here we go. Are you ready? Here it is. It is for freedom. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Jesus set us free from the slavery and tyranny of having to constantly prove our worth and save ourselves and transform our own hearts by perfect obedience all the time. 
We think of our relationship with God financially a lot. We think that we're in debt a lot and that we have to make it up. The freedom that we have in Christ is that Jesus Christ has paid our debt on the cross. Amen? And then what we think as Christians is, well, that's great. Yes, I believe that. He died for my sins. Wonderful. And now I have to keep it up because I don't have much money in my bank account. And so therefore, I have to do all these good works so that God isn't mad at me again. Wrong. That's just slavery again. God has set you free from that burden. He's given you his righteousness, which is all the money you could ever earn or spend. Does that make sense? God doesn't want you enslaved to this idea that I have to be perfect all the time. He wants to set you free because you are free in Christ to know him and to love him and to be loved by him. Amen? Amen. And see, we can even be a slave to thinking that life has to be fair. That's the law. You get what you deserve. You get what you earn. But that's a miserable way to live. Why? Because there's no Christmas. I don't deserve anything. How many of your kids actually deserve the presents that they got? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody have a, one child? Debbie had, the, right? One kid. No kid deserves Christmas. None. All are fallen and sinful, right? If we only got what we deserved, that would be the most miserable poverty in the world, right? Salvation isn't fair. Jesus loving me and forgiving me isn't fair. You need to understand that fairness is not justice. They're different, okay? Fairness is about me getting exactly what I deserve, and that's awful. Freedom in Christ is letting go of our desire to control everyone and everything. I don't have to judge everyone like my tribe demands. Freedom in Christ means that I can trust Jesus to be the judge because he's the only one who's simultaneously just and beautifully unfair. He's just by paying the debt we could never pay with his own life. And he's unfair because he does that for us and he doesn't make us pay, he pays. Amen? Freedom is listening to Jesus and following his lead because he has good things for me. Freedom is that we have, we get to laugh hysterically like Abraham and Sarah at the goodness of God, even when our circumstances and surroundings and past mistakes would be normally summarized as I'm a failure. (laughs) Oh, come on now. Anybody on plan A for their life? B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. No, nobody is, right? And that's because if our life was about, oh, being a success or a failure, and that's what made us, uh, you know, feel good about ourselves, give me a break. The freedom we have is to trust God in the middle of it all. Live in God's freedom with confidence. He chooses you for a reason. You have amazing things to give to this church and to your friends and to your family. Amen? Amen. And you might say to yourself, yeah, Andy, I can't do all that much. Remember the context of these stories. Abraham and Sarah were old as the dirt they were sitting in. (laughs) Under a tent with no AC in Oildale. (laughs) Miserable picking the little food they had to eat out of their few remaining teeth, bitter with resentment towards each other, and too old and too tired and too hot to fight anymore. That's where they were in their life. And then God shows up. Paul's writing to a church of maybe 40 to 50 people. They didn't have the building that we have. They don't have the resources that we have. They didn't have the children's minister or the worship band or anything else. They didn't even really have a pastor. It was just a group group of people banded together. That was it. We don't know their names. We don't know how much money they had in their bank account. They didn't build any lasting buildings, but they changed the world. Living in freedom that God gives us means that we understand something profound. Your love 
your forgiveness, your faith, it will change the course of generations to come because God, read this with me, because God will always make good on his promises. Oh, come on, give me some snaps. Let's go, ready? You feel small, but so do the first raindrops in a storm that ends a drought which brings life to barren land. That's you. So, Paul says, stand in your freedom. Why? Because the enemy wants to take your freedom from you. Don't you understand? The enemy always wants you to drag you back to try and condemn you for for making a mistake or back into tribalism to create division. The enemy hates your freedom. Why? Because it was a bunch of nobodies that trusted Jesus for the very first time and changed the history of the entire world. And all of these massive demonic powers with immense power couldn't do anything for, uh, against us with Jesus. That makes the devil mad. Did you know that? If just a couple people like us trust God, we change the course of generations. And by faith, we don't see that right now, but by faith, we believe that because here's these two old farts sitting in a tent in the middle of nowhere, and they changed the world. (laughs) Amen? Amen? So when you mess up and make a mistake, don't let go of your freedom and start condemning yourself and hating yourself and destroying yourself. Stand in your freedom and say, I am forgiven for way more than this. When somebody you disagree with or somebody hurts you, don't go back into the slavery of resentment and nitpicking and tribalism and they're unclean and they're bad and I won't love them. Don't go back into that slavery. Stand in the freedom of mercy. Stand in the freedom of love. And if you need to love them from a distance because they're truly uh, unhealthy people, then love them from a distance, but still love them. Stand in your freedom. Next slide. You're a bad mamma jamma. (laughs) When a person makes a mistake, stand in your freedom. The enemy says, make them pay. Forgive. Forgive. The enemy wants you to shut your heart off from them. And I say, keep your heart open because that's the freedom that we have in Christ. And when they apologize, then there'll be a chance for reconciliation. Your job isn't to change them. Your job isn't to manage them. Your job is to love them just as Jesus loves you. Stand in your freedom. The enemy wants you to believe that you cannot sacrifice for this church, that you cannot sacrifice for your friends, that you cannot sacrifice for your family because you don't have enough. Hogwash. It's a lie. Oh, it won't work. It'll be wasted. You don't have enough. Stand in the freedom. You are an heir to the king of kings. Do you think God has enough for you? Every time you're sacrificed, he will provide what you need. Every time. See, the best argument that people have against Christians is that we're self-righteous rule followers who break all the rules and pretend that we don't. That's what everybody outside the church thinks. Here's a bunch of people who think that they're superior because they follow all the rules, but they don't follow all the rules. And this first letter, the earliest, this is the chronologically, Galatians is the earliest letter that Paul writes. It's the first letter that he writes. And what is he saying? It's entirely written to help self-righteous Christians stop being religious rule followers and start living as who we truly are. Read this with me. Lost and now found dead and now alive, who know Jesus and are known by him, who love others with the same crazy love Jesus has for us. Want to pray a dangerous prayer with me? You sure? It'll change your life. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm no longer a slave. I'm free because of you. Thank you. I take back my freedom the enemy has stolen. I take back my love and my joy. Thank you for being so generously unfair with your love and kindness to me, Jesus. 
Fill me with faith and gratitude and the courage to live in my freedom today. I trust you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, would you bless and seal all the good things that have been prayed and spoken and sung in my friend's heart today. Thank you, Jesus, for the freedom that you've given us. Thank you, Jesus, that, that when the enemy seeks to rob and steal the freedom that you give, you are there to defend. Right now, Holy Spirit, you're awakening us to parts of our inheritance that we've left behind. Jesus, I pray for revival in the hearts of my friends here right now. More prayer, more love, more kindness, more joy, more reconciliation, more generosity, more of your presence in their life. That they'll be awash with your goodness and love. Bless them, Jesus. Thank you for them. I'm so grateful for these people. I just pray your protection over them now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I love you guys. We have calorie-free food for you. <laughs> Would you stand for the benediction? And if you want prayer, come forward for prayer. And don't forget, table stock starts across the street in about 15 minutes, okay? You can talk about this message and pray to your bones if you want to. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, that's his delight in you, and give you the peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's beloved saints said, Amen. Have a great day, guys. Love you. Pastor Andy Rock is the senior pastor of Coastal Community Church. It's located in Grover Beach, California and serves communities across the Central Coast. Join us online each week on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our weekly live stream. We also have two in-person services at 9 a.m. and 1040 a.m. in our sanctuary. Coastal Community Church is located at 1830 Farrell Road, Grover Beach, California. For more information, visit our website, www.mycoastal.org. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a great week.